God works through unexpected people and unorthodox behavior. I see this in today's readings and in my own life, and maybe you do too. Throughout scripture, God's message is proclaimed and his reign advanced through some pretty unexpected people and unorthodox behavior. Samuel's mother, Hannah, she was an unexpected prophet. She used to go to the temple grieving her inability to have a child and she prayed so fervently that she raised quite a few eyebrows. The temple priest Eli saw her talking so animatedly by herself that he thought she was drunk. When Hannah conceived Samuel she sang the song that inspired Mary's Magnificat. My heart rejoices in the Lord. And she went on to sing about the unexpected people God uses to advance God's kingdom. The Lord raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the garbage heap to seat them with nobles. And he gives them a seat of honor as an inheritance. So it is this very Samuel, the young fella who unexpectedly heard God calling him in the night as we heard in last Sunday's reading, who in today's first reading is sent by God to find a new king to replace Saul. The message Samuel receives from God is that he's not to judge by stature or appearance. And lo and behold, the youngest son of Jesse, David, whom no one would have even thought of as a contender, is the very one that Samuel anoints unexpected people with unorthodox behavior. Young David, before he was king, was being hunted and haunted by Saul, who was trying to kill him. And while hungry and in hiding, David lied to a priest so that he could be given some bread to eat to share with his companions, even though it was the holy bread and it was set aside for special religious rituals. Jesus's growing and motley crew of traveling companions, I imagine an unusual group of women and men around Jesus's age, young adults, they do something akin to David's unorthodox move in today's gospel from Mark. They pluck some heads of grain from a field to eat. And because it's the Sabbath, the Pharisees see this as paramount paramount to harvesting on the Sabbath, which is unlawful, unorthodox. And Jesus's response is to remind them of David's unlawful, unorthodox behavior when he and his companions ate the holy bread. And then Jesus schools the Pharisees in the real meaning and reason for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. The Son of Man is the Lord even of the Sabbath. Who is the unexpected bearer of the kingdom to you? What unorthodox behavior is changing the way you see things? My students and I at Don Bosco Krista Ray have been working this school year on understanding the sacraments and what it means to have a sacramental worldview. My heart is rejoicing at the end of the semester and I'm really being ministered to by my students as I read their descriptions in their final project of sacramental worldview like this one sacramental worldview is an understanding that the material world is infused with spiritual meaning and significance or this one sacramental worldview allows us to approach life with reverence or Living a sacramental worldview is seeing that everything has been created and loved on by God. Okay, and this one, his invisible but true influence and power is alive in the physical world and sacraments are moments where we can peer into that invisible realm, almost like a heaven here on earth. And finally, this one is so poetic that it really made my heart sing. The effects of sacraments reflect essential points in our lives
lives where the grace of God is raining on us in its most powerful form. With this in mind, viewing your entire time on this planet as a sacrament places you in a perspective where you're allowing God's grace to always reach you. This is what a sacramental worldview is. So my heart kind of sank when this very same student who wrote that last reflection on sacramental worldview, when writing about his personal experience of Eucharist, he said this, I receive the Eucharist very scarcely now because I'm often not in a state of holy grace. The Catechism of the Catholic Church in section 1415 states that, quote, anyone who desires to receive Christ in Eucharistic communion must be in a state of grace. Is the Eucharist the reward for saints or the bread for sinners? Our prophet Hannah, whose unseemly and unorthodox behavior at the temple turned a few heads, proclaimed that God invites those in need of grace, which is all of us, to the table. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the garbage heap to seat them with nobles, and he gives them a seat of honor as an inheritance. For the pillar of the earth, the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he set the world on them. Our God is Lord, isn't he? Even of the Sabbath.